My name is Jacob Schul. Um, I've been studying cultural heritage on the Daimert Academy in Amsterdam. And I've been uh, involved uh, for a couple of years in the Exarch. Um, I'm going to present today something about uh, archaeological reconstructions. Um, and I do that from a perspective from a museological uh, theory. And um, yeah, my research, what I did was uh, for my thesis. Um, and uh, what I did, I was looking to archaeological reconstruction primary based on uh, archaeological sources, um, where the artifact for the reconstruction was being used as a prototype for the reconstruction. And I only looked at uh, locations where, uh, where non-in-situ, so I didn't look to reconstructions on the site itself, but to uh, reconstructions uh, in, for example, archaeological open air museums. Um, oh yeah, for example, that can be like houses, small objects, but I also looked at uh, living history and uh, reenactment. Um, okay. Okay, so where I started with is that um, I looked at what kind of reconstructions are there. Um, I make a difference between reconstructions who have the same appearance as the original and or have a different appearance as the original. For example, um, <coughs> reconstructions with different appearance are like digital reconstructions, 3D models and simulations. Um, for my re reconstruction, I only looked at the, the first group. Um, so as you can see, reconstructions with the same appearance. Um, what I did, I took the theory of John Colt uh, from Experimental Archaeology, his book, and uh, he describes that there are three different kinds of uh, reconstructions. First are uh, visual reconstructions. He said like that those reconstructions are only usable for uh, museum presentations, and in that uh, perspective, uh, or those reconstructions are only like in the physical form, so you only look at them how they uh, might be looked at. Then he says there's a second layer, and that's our visual and material reconstructions. It is this kind of reconstructions, he say that uh, materials what are being used in the reconstruction are the same as uh, the original, but uh, they don't have the same functionality as the original or uh, at least that's not important in this kind of reconstruction. And the last group of reconstructions are functional reconstructions, where uh, you actually can use the reconstruction as it would have been in the past. Um, I also looked at um, uh, living history for like in, uh, intangible uh, reconstructions. For example, reenactment, um, where um, Yeah, where, where only it's more like a theater play, so it's more important to, uh, to the, the appearance of the reconstruction. The public has a view on uh, how something had looked like. Then um, you have third person interpretations. That uh, are interpretations where the person is, is uh, dressed like the past, but he isn't the past. So uh, he tells about the past and how the past uh, had been looked like and uh, what could be done and what he's doing as an, um, as an interpreter. And uh, first person interpretations where the person who's representing the past is actually the past. So he's really telling I'm um, a person from the Iron Age and I'm doing this and this and um, I'm blacksmith for example. Um, uh, why I also took this in my analy analy analyzation is because um, I see that this is also part of the material culture. Um, and I know there's been some discussions about it, or is this not intangible heritage? Well, my opinion is that this is not intangible heritage because uh, this is not um, putting on generation on generation to, um, yeah, to the, so it keeps it alive. Um, so that's why um, I would say yeah, that this is part of the material culture because these uh, interpretations the persons are doing are based on archaeological evidence and on objects 
and uh, they use that um, to interpret it past. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so the basic what I did was um, I looked at the theory for a museological theory from Peter van Mens. He's a Dutch museologist, and he came up with the idea um, that all objects are analyzed by certain uh, identities. Um, the main concept of his idea is that all objects are made by two things. The first thing is that there needs to be an ID, so the maker has an ID, and, and the maker needs matter. So he needs the materials, he needs the, 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 the surrounding, he needs everything in the matter form to, um, to, make a to, to make an artifact, actually. This is about the original. And um, if you put those two together, you get uh, the factual identity. So that's the moment that the artifact is ready. Um, that's after the process of making it. And um, what you also can see is sometimes, um, where is the thing? That he's going from the factual identity to the conceptual identity because he's for example, developing his uh, artifact. So this is this is not a straight line. It sometimes can go back. Um, in afterwards, he uh, the maker puts or the makers put the object in the in the world, and he said it's ready. And then um, it goes slowly to the actual identity, and that's the the moment the object is in our time. So that's the the, the time now. Um, Check of everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in this time, an object can have different owners, can have different kinds of meanings, can also um, sometimes get lost, and people are rediscovering it again and thinking about it and, um, and going to reuse it in new ways. So this is this this can be a lot of different um, contexts. Um, this, this line can be analyzed by three different uh, identities. The first is the structural, structural identity of the object. And here um, the object is, uh, can be analyzed in, um, for example, the shape, the color, the texture. And also by time objects can change uh, in, in, in that form. And um, the same is with the functionality. Uh, the functionality can be um, the, like a practical use, but can also be a symbolic uh, functionality, and um, and in that uh, and as well, this can be changed. For example, we give another um, um, value to a museum object nowadays, and it would be as an an object, a tool in the past. We think now nowadays otherwise about that. Um, and then you get as well the contextual identity and um, the context, uh, contextual identity, there are multiple levels in that one how you could analyze that. The first is that um, you can look at the object itself, so what are the objects around it. Uh, it can be that the, um, it can be like the, the whole world or the, 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 the area or the landscape where this object is in. But it can also be like um, the context of the object itself in the time. For example, in his primary context, that's in the begin of the of the timeline, he will uh, be like, for example, a tool. But later on, this tool could be uh, used by other owners. They change it, so it gets a new kind of context. And all these different kinds of contexts are laying on each other until we analyze the object in in our time. Um, okay, so then I, I, what I did is I said like, okay, this is the information of the, the original artifact and I um, <coughs> see this as a prototype for the reconstruction. So all these kind of values you can analyze to put in a reconstruction. Um, beside that, I saw as well that reconstructions are used secondary information for example, ar other archaeological artifacts, ethnological uh, research, historical sources, and uh, experimental archaeology. And I'm not an archaeologist, but probably you guys know a lot more of external sources you can uh, use for making a uh, 
reconstruction. Um, but for me, what was really in important is actually the influence of the maker itself on this um, reconstruction. Um, because uh, we saw already in the first presentation as well, sometimes uh, the maker makes a, like a sort of um, his own concept about it. He thinks about it by itself. And this is also having an influence on this reconstruction. Um, so even the maker of the reconstruction is going through the same process as the maker of the original artifact. Uh, so he's going to a process of ID and matter, and he's 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 going on, he's going to do all those steps as well. Um, other influences he also need to think about is, for example, the functionality reconstruction get. Um, we know, for example, in archaeological open air museums, um, reconstructions are also used for educational purposes. For example, uh, here is an image of an Iron Age house where children sleep in in the farm area. So the function the reconstruction sometimes get is not the same as it had in the past. So in that way, you could say that the, ob the object itself has another kind of meaning, another kind of value, even if it's tried to represent the same uh, yeah, original artifact. Um, another thing what I know in our political open air museums, for example, happens is that law and regulations are having a big influence on, uh, on the reconstruction. For example, here's a Roman wall of a museum in Archeon in Holland, where they put an extra fence in the back. So people who are walking over this reconstruction they get because of that another kind of feeling of what this, uh, how this had looked like and, and how um, people probably used it. So um, that's all influences uh, we need to think about. Um, so what I then did is I took the idea of, okay, we have like the, the original object is going through all these phases. And then I said like, okay, this, so this, all this information is part of the prototype. And this prototype um, creates an image what eventually goes through the reconstruction. And here you can see that the, um, yeah, the reconstruction is this process on itself again, and that you see all the influences are going into it. And what's really interesting is that the maker of this reconstruction, you need to think in a way as, the maker had here. So in, to, to by using this model, I uh, try to figure out um, yeah, what kind of values you can see in a reconstruction, because I see a reconstruction as a museum object or an object on itself again as well. It has a meaning on itself as well. It, um, for example, uh, and that's why this influence is so important, it's also the idea we have now of the past is, in par is also part of this reconstruction um, by, uh, because of technology and all those kind of uh, advantages are changing. We see that this reconstruction uh, gets, uh, yeah, if, if, you make, if you look at reconstructions from 10 years ago and you look at reconstructions we are now look like, we will probably have a big difference between them. So, um, yeah, that's what I uh, did. Um, and okay. Yeah, and, and why I think this is really important because I uh, want to make aware of that if we're making reconstructions, um, okay, then um, yeah, okay. If we're making reconstructions. Um, it's, it's not only a museum display, it's not only an experiment, it is, it, is, it is also an object on itself and there are values in it and we should be aware of that and we should also analyze that because we're representing something what um, yeah, is for our public really important to, to, to know the past. Uh, but there is uh, as well, for example, the influence of the maker and the maker, we can sometimes that's not uh, transmitted to the public where this influence has been. So, yeah, I hope with this that I get a uh, sort of view of uh, how I think the reconstruction process in archaeological open air museums works. Okay, thank you. Thank you.